So again, you have uh, signed up for and are now attending the Humanities in Class uh, webinar titled Battle Lines, A Graphic History of the Civil War. I'm very pleased to be joined by Professor Ari Kelman from uh, University of California at Davis. Uh, Professor Kelman is the Chancellor's Leadership Professor of History and Interim Dean. I suspect that uh, anytime the word interim is there in front of it, uh, Ari, that means that you get twice the work that you might normally. Um, I also want to note that we are joined tonight by Jennifer Stockdale. Jennifer is a middle school uh, social studies teacher in Independence, Missouri, member of this year's Teacher Advisory Council, and she'll be our TA for the night. Uh, Jennifer will be sharing thoughts and asking questions in the chat box, and also will be curating some resources uh, that we will share. So, uh, Professor, I'd like to, to welcome you to the program. Thank you for joining us. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to, if it's all right, I'm going to do just a quick sound check also with the audience. Yes. Um, if someone in the audience chat could let me know if I speak at around this volume, if you could hear me. I'd really appreciate it. If someone could just chime in and say, hey, we can hear you or not, that would be great. And while they do that, uh, Ari, I'm, I'm actually going to open with a, a question of my own. Um, there sometimes is a slight delay, so I think you'll see in the audience chat that they're going to give you that feedback. Scott Smith, our good friend and colleague in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, is letting us know. Um, Ari, I've got a question for you before we get started, and it's one that I think, if I were in the audience, would be on my mind. And I'm, I'm hopeful that as an historian, as a scholar, as a professional educator and researcher, um, I, I hope you'll be vulnerable with us in this question. Ari, can, can you draw? <laughs> you know, seriously, because expressing yourself through drawing is a pain in the butt for me. And I know that when I ask kids to draw, at any given point, there's a, there's some, there's a percentage of kids in the class who are like, oh, no, don't make me do that. So can can you draw what what is your connection here to the to the visual part of this? Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to give you uh what is going to be regrettably a somewhat long answer to that question, but yeah. it's going to lead us into the topic of the evening. But before I do that, if it's all right, Andy, I just want to say to uh what looks like an audience of of about 230 some people, uh welcome. Um I'm really excited to be here uh with you this evening. Um, and I'm particularly excited to be part of an event uh, at the National Humanities Center. My, my only regret is that uh, I'm not in North Carolina right now. Uh, for those of you uh, who do not know, the National Humanities Center is, is one of the, the great gems uh, in the United States. Um, it's a place uh, where scholars go, they, they come together, uh, they learn, they do research, uh, and importantly, uh, they share the fruits of that research in the humanities with the public, um, particularly as uh, on this occasion, uh, sometimes we get the opportunity to interact with teachers uh, and talk about the way in which we can interpret the humanities uh, for students. And I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled about the opportunity to do that this evening. Um, so to your question, Andy, I cannot draw, I cannot sing, I cannot dance. Um, I am uh, one of the very least uh, creative people that I know. Um, I, I happen to have a, a very, very close circle of friends, uh, most of whom have been my friends for a very, very long time. Uh, and almost all of them are filmmakers, photographers, novelists, um, and, I'm, uh, and I'm just kind of the loser of the bunch. Um, <laughs> having said that, uh, I, I do want to talk tonight about some of the ways in which imagining the past and understanding the past visually can help us and can help, uh, sorry, when I say us, I mean historians and teachers, but can also help our students uh, interpret history as historians. Um, that the act of thinking visually is something that forces us to move outside of a comfort zone uh, this was not something that I necessarily understood when I began working on this project. Uh, the project, let's see if I can pull up the slide, is right here. Uh, Battle Lines, a Graphic History of the Civil War. Uh, as you can see from, this, uh, from, from the book's cover, um, I worked on this with an illustrator, uh, with Jonathan Fetter-Vorm. Um, Jonathan, before working on this book with me, had written his own graphic history of the atomic bomb project, 
Uh, someone early in the audience chat mentioned uh, that they didn't know of graphic books to teach science topics. Uh, and Jonathan's book is called Trinity. Um, and it is because the Trinity Project was the atomic bomb project. And it's a, it's a very, very beautifully done book. And as I'm about to describe for you, uh, Jonathan spent a lot of time as we were working on this project in its early stages, uh, effectively educating me in how to do this kind of work. It, it wasn't simply a matter that I don't know how to draw. And again, I mean, I'm, I, I, I cannot tell you uh, just how bad I am. Um, it was also that I didn't understand what it meant to write a graphic book like this one. And so uh, Jonathan, um, in the earliest stages of this project, uh, well, first of all, he and I were set up um, by the publisher. Uh, the publisher put the, the two of us together. Uh, we ended up getting along very, very well because Jonathan is kind of a wonderful weirdo. Uh, he would studied history uh, at Stanford University as an undergraduate where while he was an undergraduate, uh, he put together a number of uh, graphic books uh, of his own. Uh, these were sort of short books that he did. After graduating from Stanford, he moved to Italy and uh, apprenticed himself to a binder of fine books, which is you know, just the sort of thing that all of us do, right? We spend a couple of years in Italy learning how to bind books. He then came back to the United States, uh, went to, uh, to Hill and Wang, to Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and, and, and said to them, hey, um, I'm, I'm looking for a, a, a job. Uh, I'd like to work in your art department. And the head of the art department said, well, you know, you, you, have, a, you have a degree from an art school, right, Mr. Federborm? And Jonathan said, no, but I've, I've drawn a bunch of weird stuff. Here's my graphic interpretation of Beowulf. Uh, and oddly enough, they didn't give him a job, but, but one of the editors there heard about this and, and reached out to Jonathan and connected with him and attached him to this book uh, on, the, on, uh, excuse me, on the Atomic Bomb Project, again, book called Trinity. Uh, the author, the lead author, the historian ended up dropping off of the project and Jonathan completed it himself. So, so I then was in, introduced to Jonathan by this same editor. He and I hit it off. Jonathan, in, in the earliest stages of the project, said to me, great, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to write this, uh, this, this graphic book with you. Um, I'll illustrate it. You'll be the author. It'll be great. Um, we'll have a good time. All I need for you to do is write a script for chapter one. And I said, awesome, no problem. And so I sat down at my computer and I banged out what I thought was a script for the first chapter of a graphic history of the Civil War. Um, and it was about 46 pages of text. And I sent it to Jonathan. And I don't know whether or not we're allowed to swear on these uh, during these presentations. This, but, this um, is adults only. Okay, well, you know, Jonathan uh, wrote me an email back. Um, well, I'll just say that the email basically said, uh, uh, let's see here, it was sort of like this in all caps. Um, <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, what in the world are you doing? You just sent me a book chapter. This is, this is completely worthless. Uh, I, I have absolutely no idea what you're thinking about. And I said, well, no, man, that's, that's the script that I sent you, and, and it's good stuff. You know, like, read it. And he said, I, I'm not going to bother reading this. This is of absolutely no value to me. And he, he then said, when, when we talk about scripting these things, what we mean is that you literally have to script this the way that you would uh, a, um, the way that you would a, a movie or, or perhaps a play. And he said, what I need you to do is I need you to write me the very, very shortest version of what the chapter is going to be about. And this, this is uh, chapter three. This is uh, the title of which is Opera Glasses. And I'll explain why it's called Opera Glasses in a moment. Um, this is our chapter on the, the Battle of First Bull Run. 
and he said, I, I need almost like a, a, a pre of this. I need you to tell me what the background is, what's going to be happening. And then what I need you to do is I need you to actually script this. So I, I hope everyone can see this right now. But what, oh, Andy, are there slides? I can't see anything in the slides tab. Uh, that's yeah. what uh, Natalie Alvarez is saying, Andy. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I see that. Thank you, thank you for noticing that. And I'll, I'll remind Natalie and everyone that there are three tabs at the top slides, headshots, and surveys, just make sure that the slides tab is, uh, is selected on your own screen. Yeah, um, they, it's, I, all, I, I, it's all good, Ari, thank you. Yeah, okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, having said that, my headshot is incredibly glamorous and people may want to spend some time with that. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, so what you're seeing on here is, uh, this would be page 32 of the book, at the top where it says 32.1, that is the first panel on page 32. And again, I, I know all of you are capable of doing your own reading, but you'll see here, this is a large splash panel that's gonna fill the page. It shows a hillside, people with picnickers, et cetera. Then we go to 32.2, .2, and again, you've got a setting of the scene for the person who's going to be drawing this. It shows Elsie with a picture coming up to mother and son. And then we get to dialogue on 32.2, 32.3, and so on. So, so it took Jonathan teaching me how to do this in order for me to understand that actually this was the way in which the collaboration would work. I then produced a script that looks very, very much like the slide that's in front of you right now. I would send that script back to Jonathan. We did all of this uh, via email and phone. We, we lived on opposite sides of the country. I was in California, uh, and he at that time was in Brooklyn, New York, because um, by federal statute, if you're an illustrator, you have to live in Brooklyn. Uh, and so Jonathan would get the script from me, and then he would show, uh, he would send me line drawings. And that's what you're seeing here. These are incredibly crude line drawings. Jonathan would send them back to me, and he would say, hey, what do you think of these? Um, and I would say every single time, oh, yeah, man, those look great having absolutely no idea, right? Like I just, I had no clue whatsoever uh, what to tell him other than these look terrific. He would then say, okay, good. I'll actually do a little bit more of the work here. And you can start to see what that work looked like on this page. Again, these are still line drawings, but this was Jonathan's effort to to move into the next stage. And it was at this point when I could start to give him feedback where I could say to him either, hey, you know what, Jonathan, I have some concerns about the way this looks, or you're not accurately representing uh, the way in which a uniform might have appeared, or this soldier's flintlock looks wrong, or something of that nature. Um, we did this for the entire book. Uh, it took us about 18 months. We then presented a full draft of the book, not yet in color, still relatively rough to our publisher, at which point one of the first major turning points in the project uh, came upon us. And that was that our editor left the press where we were working and moved on to another press. A new editor came in and decided that she wanted to work with this orphaned project. And she said to us, I love the project, but I actually want you to do it in full color and I want it to be in landscape rather than portrait. Now, again, I just want to give you a sense of a sort of a measure of, of, of how ignorant I was throughout this process and how I was constantly having to learn new things. I didn't realize when she asked us this that as we moved from, again, a portrait orientation in black and white to a landscape orientation, it meant that we needed to redo the entire book. Uh, those of you who know anything about graphic books or about comics or even about art, uh, maybe those of you who are just not quite um, as dumb as I am, probably would have put that together pretty quickly. 
but shifting the orientation from this to this means that the visual storytelling changes very, very, very abruptly. It means that you're moving the reader through the page in a different way, and also that you have to array your story on the page horizontally, and the reader is going to need to understand that. So Jonathan and I then redid the entire book, same process, going through line drawings, beginning with pencils, then beginning to use ink, then thinking about the way in which Jonathan would shade these same drawings. You can see how we married all of this eventually, and then finally adding color. You can see we used a relatively muted palette the idea was to try and capture images that would, for the reader, be relatively evocative of the moment that we were trying to depict. And then finally, adding dialogue. You see the dialogue here. So I'm actually going to take use this as a pause. Uh, and, and Andy, if you want to see if people have questions yeah. uh, before I move into the next uh, part of this, I think that would be great. Yeah, I would. I've got a few questions myself, and I will always encourage our audience to drop questions into Ask Professor Kelman. And uh, as the moderator, I'll bring them forward. But you know, my first question here, Ari, is um, when you are approaching this as an historian, an historian trained in the close reading of and the analysis of documents and of text, primarily, particularly 19th century. Um, what did you feel was the the, the most essential uh, metrics that you had in order to contribute? Um, were you trying to be accurate to the history? Were you trying to convey the spirit and the culture? What 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 was your approach as an historian when you engaged with this? Um, that's a great question. So uh, Jonathan and I had um, what I would describe as. Uh, genuinely creative tension around precisely that issue. Um, Jonathan is uh, an artist, and uh, though I think he's a really talented historian, um, he's not trained uh, in the discipline. And um, so he and I uh, struggled fairly consistently around exactly where we were going to draw a variety of different lines. And, and, and pardon me, that's not a double entendre. That's, I, I mean that we were trying to establish boundaries. Um, what we eventually determined was that my greatest contributions would be, first of all, uh, that Jonathan doesn't know very much about the Civil War. So, so the, the overall conception of the book, the narrative, the choices of which episodes to treat uh, and which episodes to ignore, those were my choices. I'm to blame for those. Um, second of all, uh, going to your, uh, directly to your question about tone, um, it was important from my perspective that we tried to capture a vernacular and colloquialisms that were appropriate to the era, and also that the art represent the era uh, in ways that I saw as appropriately faithfully. As a consequence, Jonathan ended up doing quite a bit of archival work uh, at my suggestion. I would send him uh, links to hundreds and hundreds of photographs of battlefields, but also of urban areas, uh, just so that he could get a sense of, of what things looked like, the way people dressed, et cetera. And then finally, we, we ended up having some very, very challenging discussions about two issues. One was whether or not we were going to have a through character, which is to say a single character that the audience could relate to and follow through the entire book. Um, some of you may forgive me for a dated reference, but like a, a Civil War zelig. Um, someone who just like happened to be at all of these places. Jonathan wanted that for very, very good reasons. Uh, he has um, a novelist uh, approach to the past. I had real misgivings about it because there wasn't someone who could play that role. 
other than perhaps someone like Lincoln. And we decided because we were interested in telling this story from the bottom up rather than the top down, that we didn't want Lincoln or Grant or Lee to be appearing uh, in the book particularly frequently. So we ended up not having a through character because it wouldn't have the, the uh, sorry, I'm going to speak to Lori who's saying, are there any slides? Right now you should be see, uh, seeing uh, a void um, here. I'll move to the next one just so people don't wonder about that. So we ended up not having a through character. And then the second question that we really needed to answer was what were we going to do about dialogue? And, and what we came up with was that any time we had a non-fictional character depicted in the story, they would never say anything that was fictional dialogue. In other words, let's imagine that there's a moment in which Stephen Douglas appears in the book or Abraham Lincoln appears in the book. We wouldn't have them saying, I love graphic novels or... Ari Kelman is a great historian. We would only have words coming out of their mouths that they actually spoke in the moment. But when we would use non-fictional characters, characters that we used as composites, we would then allow them to use what we saw as period correct, again, appropriately colloquial, using the right vernacular, dialogue. And, and you'll see how some of that functioned uh, in a moment. So I can either move yeah. into this next, I, I can either walk people through one chapter in the book, which again gives you a sense of how we sort of operationalized a lot of the discussion that I just went into. Or again, I'm happy to, to answer a few other questions. Totally uh, up to you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, there are some questions queuing up, and I'll I'll try to balance them throughout the presentation. I would like to take one more question before we move on. Uh, this is from Tisha, who's joining us from Connecticut. Tisha asks, if you can say a little bit more about point of view. It, it seems to her that just as with film, the visualization of the speaker would perhaps carry more weight than text alone. That's a great question. Um, so point of view shifts throughout the story. Uh, and the reason for that is explicitly because we didn't have that through character. We decided that we wanted to assume multiple perspectives in the text, uh, sometimes the perspective of an individual who would see troops rushing toward them, sometimes the perspective of an omniscient or a third person narrator. Um, and then in some instances, we very, very intentionally played with narrative conventions and conventions of perspective to try, we hoped, to spur in the viewer some sense of the artifice behind creating this kind of a book. Now, let me, let, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you an illustration of that in a moment. So very, very quickly, we're now looking at chapter eight, this is our chapter on Gettysburg. Uh, trying to think about the way to visualize Gettysburg was overwhelming. Um, there have been, as many of you probably know, uh, a, a number of cinematic depictions. Uh, there's, there are great works of art uh, about Gettysburg. And so we felt very, very constrained by a pre-existing uh, visual canon around this. And so we decided that we were actually going to talk about Gettysburg in its aftermath. Before getting to that, though, at the beginning of each chapter, you'll see we mocked up a fake newspaper. Uh, and the way in which we did that is we had two very, very brief articles that I wrote. They're, they're really short, which situate the reader in time and space so the reader understands exactly where they are in the narrative of the book and also where they fall in the history of the Civil War. We do this just to give them a little bit more context than they would have otherwise. And then at the bottom right of each of these headers at the beginning of the chapter, these, these fake newspapers, you can see these rumors from the front, Lee's army on the march in Pennsylvania. So again, the reader then knows exactly where she's going to be or where they're going to be as they move into the chapter. And so here we are in the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, someone a moment, I think it was John Slavin who said the idea of history is artifice, um, depending on who's controlling the narrative. 
I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. And what we're looking at are some of the iconic landscapes of Gettysburg that, that most readers uh, who, if they know anything about the Civil War, they would have heard of the Peach Orchard, Cemetery Hill, the Devil's Den, et cetera. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to show you the two pages, to the two pages side by side, but this is uh, the first of, of what you'll see is a panorama. Um, and you can see what the aftermath uh, of, of the battle looked like, Gettysburg, the day after. Uh, we were very um, intentional in our decision not to show uh, human corpses in these images, and, and we had a particular reason for that. So we then introduced the idea uh, that um, the battle left behind its own set of markers, and you can see there's uh, some torn uniforms, there's blood, and then we're introduced to the figure who is going to be the key uh, figure in this uh, chapter, and that's Alexander Gardner, um, who's uh, one of the, the two, along with Matthew Brady, most famous photographers uh, of the Civil War. And, and we chose Gardner, as you'll see in a moment, because we were interested in a particular image that he used. So here you're seeing in the bottom right of this, Gardner is literally trying to frame an image as he is trying to produce history. And you see that he's doing this in a particular place, in a particular time. Again, that framing device centered in, uh, on this page to try and make sure that the reader understands what we're getting at. We then, and now I'm going to go back to a question you were asking earlier, Andy, we then introduce two additional characters. These are fictional characters. We know that Gardner had assistance with him when he was at the Gettysburg battlefield, but we don't know much about these people. So we've got them using non-fictional dialogue, right? We, we believe that it is period appropriate. We're reasonably confident about what we're doing here, but it's not Gardner himself because we don't have Gardner's words from that day. He remains silent. But you can see they're talking about the fact that they're going to need a body because they're obviously trying to compose an image here. And you can see they find someone. I apologize. This, the, the, the book is rather grim, uh, and a number of the images are rather grim. But they say, let's drop him next to the wall. Gardner then goes underneath his hood and waits uh, to take this image. And then you can see that it's framed. This is the actual image itself. It takes a long time. Now watch close. You might learn something. I already learned what I need. Oh yeah, what's that? That this is a hell of a lot easier when they're dead. And of course, this is, this is a, a, a brutal way of encapsulating the way in which the historian's art is its own kind of artifice. It is arranging the events of the past into a particular narrative that readers will be able to understand and access. And in this particular instance, we used the image that Gardner captured in that moment, focusing on, and forgive me, this is one of the very few terms of art that I'll use in this talk. Yeah, it is the actual photo, Amanda. Focusing on the image of this young soldier's uh, face. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the most haunting uh, uh, images of the Civil War era. And of course, it was entirely posed. They moved the body. They created this context. They captured a sense of the violence and the brutality of what had taken place at Gettysburg, but it was at least in part a fiction. And that is where, again, I'm going to take a little break and I'm going to leave the, the screen. Actually, yeah, I'll leave the screen uh, dark for right now and see if anyone has questions. I, I'll tell you what I'll do just so that there's no uh, misunderstandings. I'm going to go back here just to, if anybody comes back in, they know that we're still live. Um, I've got a couple of questions, Ari, that it's, uh, that it's coming up. Um, what, one of them, several of those are more, a little bit more involved, but one of them I think is it will have a quick answer from you. Uh, Eric is asking what age level this book was marketed towards or considered, what audience this was considered. 
Uh, Eric, that's a really great question. So it, it's a, in its original point of conception, when we were uh, hired to write the book or when we signed the contract to write the book, um, we were thinking that we were writing it for uh, middle school students. Um, at, once we moved to uh, the uh, once we moved to the landscape orientation and we used full color, uh, our editor asked us if we would think about trying to reach an adult population. Um, my sense, having worked with a lot of educators around the country on this, is that it is frequently taught uh, in advanced middle school, in AP high school, and then in entry-level college classes. I, I am not sure that we, we bridged that great divide between classroom use um, and, and the so-called general adult reader market. Uh, but so the answer to your question is that that our our sense of our ta our target audience evolved over time, and and the book has built within it uh, a number of different moments in which depending on the audience it can be read very very differently. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead here, Andy. I'm not trying to foreclose additional questions. I just sure. want to answer this one to the best of my ability. So here we've got just two, I'm gonna show you two slides from, from one of the chapters. And you can see this is Frederick Douglass. And again, because it's Frederick Douglass, these are actually his words. Non-fictional character, non-fictional dialogue. You hear, you see Douglass uh, delivering one of his orations at a time like this. Scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. It is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. So uh, a reader can read this if they want to at face value, but this is a chapter about uh, the way in which so-called contraband people, uh, enslaved people who freed themselves uh, during the early period of the war prior to Lincoln's handing down the Emancipation Proclamation, but what happened to them when they moved beyond union lines and the way in which those people were often put to work doing the kind of dirty work that union soldiers didn't want to do. So here we've got Douglas talking about the need for radical change, talking about the necessity of an earthquake. And again, a reader can read that at face value or having read this full chapter, they can see that we have formerly enslaved people who are still being treated almost like slaves by the Union rather than the Confederate Army moving Earth, engaging in their own kind of earthquake. And there's a lot of material like that in the book where, again, a, a middle school student like, like my son, who right now is in eighth grade, he might read it in one way, and a 22-year-old is going to read it in a very, very different way. Thank you, and I think those images really do, uh, you know, flesh out that answer in, in a significant way. A um, couple other questions. Uh, take a little bit of a side uh, of a detour for us, and respond to Jeremiah's interest in how you, as an historian, uh, understand or what sources you may have used to understand uh, that this image was staged? How, how did you know? How do you, how, what kind of sources did you use? Yeah, we've got really great uh, source material on both Brady and Gardner. Um, they, they had studio notes and also there were observers who were there at the time who talked about the way in which uh, most of the, of the great battlefield images that we associate with the war were staged in one way or another. Uh, so if, if you want, uh, Andy, after we're done, I can try and find particular source material uh, and I can share that. I don't know if you have a way to communicate out with people who yeah. are involved in this. The other possibility is people are, of course, welcome to send me an email. I'm, I'm very available. Fantastic. And we can add that to the digital library if you supply it. Hey, one last question before you move on. I know you've got a lot of great slides to share. Uh, I'm actually going to give Jeremiah a second question here, um, and he's curious about, uh, actually, I'm just going to read his question uh, from his voice. As an historian creating a graphic novel and knowing that comic books and comics and the majority of action takes place in the gutters or the space between panels, um, how do you 
decide on what to depict and what to write for the dialogue, weren't you worried that you were leaving some really important things out? So that's a really phenomenal question. Um, not that the others haven't been good. Sorry, I feel like I'm drawing some distinction. Uh, I mean, Andy, your questions have been lousy, but the audience. <laughs> well, thank you. Been, um, so uh, the the answer to that is that what I learned over time. Uh, this is Jeremiah, right? What I learned over time, yeah. Jeremiah, is that uh, fewer words were better. Um, and that the book became more and more powerful the, the, the more I was able to script it in a way that would allow Jonathan to use images to tell the story. And, and again, I, I don't know whether or not you planned this, uh, Andy, but I'm, I'm going to just move into the, the next part because it gives you a sense of this. I do want to warn everyone who's on the call right now. Uh, that the images that I'm going to share in this moment contain uh, one in particular. Uh, it's going to be the third slide that I'm about to show. Uh, it, it's, it's an image um, of, of racial violence. Uh, sorry, it's the fourth slide. It's an image of racial violence, in fact, of a, of a lynching. And so if, if anyone is going to have a hard time with this, I just want to let you know in advance that that's about to be on the screen. I, I will give you one more warning before I put that image up because it, it, it can be very, very upsetting. But getting back to Jeremiah's question, this is the chapter that we wrote about reconstruction. Um, and what you see is that this is a chapter uh, in which we put together a number of different episodes from reconstruction um, rather than focusing uh, in depth on any one moment, we focused on a number. Now, let me, let me tell you that the way that this chapter is laid out mattered a lot. If you were looking at the book, this would be the spine of the book. So it would be open with one page here and one page here. So we move through Reconstruction, looking at different episodes of Reconstruction, looking at the emergence of the Ku Klux Klan, Nathan Bedford Forrest and others, and, and we are moving toward what was known as the Colfax Massacre. And now I'm going to back up and I'm going to show you that what you're seeing here is you're seeing the creation of a hemp rope. And this is a visual cue that's going to run throughout this chapter as this rope is becoming tighter and tighter. And you can see in this page, as we get to the Colfax massacre, this is the burn, this is the, the destruction uh, of, of the courthouse in Colfax, uh, where uh, uh, over 100 African American people uh, were holed up. You can see that this rope is being turned in, uh, is being turned into, if you're paying attention, into a noose. Um, and so you get a sense of the way in which Reconstruction isn't working and the way in which uh, uh, white supremacists in the South are maintaining, forgive me, but a stranglehold on white supremacy. Now, again, I'm about to show one final image before I go to this image. I just want to let people know this is an image of a lynching, and, and, I, and I'm going to discuss this image. And so I just, if this is going to upset anyone, I do want them to have fair warning. So this is the image in the aftermath uh, of Colfax. Uh, the white militiamen shot, stabbed, hanged, or drowned. Uh, every unarmed black man they could found, at least 100 African Americans were murdered that day. So I just need a minute. Sorry, it's been a long week. Um, none of the whites were punished. Uh, you can see here that Jonathan and I made the decision to include an image of black men hanging from a hanging tree, of them being lynched. We also made the decision not to show their faces. We didn't think that it was appropriate, and again, thinking about lines that historians do or don't cross. We didn't think that it was appropriate for us to be depicting the faces of individuals. 
Uh, and so this was the kind of compromise that we arrived at where we felt like we were appropriately depicting what happened on that day to those people without uh, without thundering their dignity um, even more uh, retrospectively. Um, it, it's an imperfect compromise. Uh, doing this kind of work, doing the work of a historian is filled with imperfect compromises. This was a particularly difficult one, but it, it, it gives you some sense again of the way in which uh, the visual rhetoric of a graphic novel, the way in which images can move a reader through these kinds of events. And, and really, I didn't need very many words uh, in order to capture what was happening. And that's, again, I, I, I can pause there uh, and, and see if anyone has any questions. I, I, I do apologize. Like I said, it's it's been a hard week uh, and it's been an emotional week. Thanks, Ari. And we will take just a moment. Um, I think some of the folks in our audience uh, also, this is a deeply affecting and effective uh, image. And of course, the being able to channel the past in such a, a compelling and emotional way is part of what helps us understand current context, contemporary context. Um, take just a moment. We do have some questions coming in, Ari, if it's okay. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. If it's okay, I'm going to move off of this image. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, Thank you. Yeah, let's do that. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit about um, whether or not, and I'm going to reframe Joel's question just a little bit, uh, whether or not there were actual figures that you really wanted to have a voice and a place in the story, but you just couldn't make it work. You couldn't fit them in. Talk, talk to us about the about what you had to leave out. Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, we leave out. We, sorry, we leave. We left out uh, a, a number of really important episodes. Uh, there's um, almost nothing in the book uh, other than in one of the newspaper essays uh, about uh, about either naval warfare or warfare on the Western rivers. Um, just to give you one example, uh, we we left out um, almost everything uh, about. Um, about the, the the sort of high command uh, of both the Union and the Confederacy. Um, I, I am going to forget, but I, I think that uh, Grant appears in the book only once. Lee appears only in a very, very odd chapter that we wrote about memory. It's about the way in which Lee's sword and the, the presentation of Lee's sword to Grant at Appomattox the way in which that functions uh, in, in the South in the aftermath of, of the Civil War um, as a kind of a mnemonic device uh, for the way in which the war was, was lost with honor. Uh, but otherwise, Lee doesn't appear in the book. Um, Lincoln only appears in the book uh, once, and he's in a coffin. Um, and so we really, uh, we really did, uh, we, we really, there were just a number of things that we, that we didn't get into. Um, and so we, we had to leave a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say one, uh, one thing that I very, very much wanted to do um, was uh, I wanted to have a chapter on the 1876 uh, World's Fair, uh, the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Um, and I, I, I wanted to do that chapter for a variety of different reasons, but I, I, I wanted that chapter to be our, our our, po our, our post reconstruction chapter. We ended up doing a chapter on, on Western railroads instead. Um, and in that chapter, I really wanted, uh, I wanted uh, what the statuary at the, at the 76th centennial to come to life and begin narrating the, the, uh, the, the chapter. And Jonathan absolutely forbade this. You know, he was just like, what kind of a hack are you, Ari? You know, like we're not having a talking statue. Uh, just absolutely ridiculous. So um, I, I was always very disappointed about that, and I still periodically uh, will send Jonathan text telling him uh, that he stole that moment from me, that it really could have been a career-making thing. Hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, Ari, we have about a half an hour left, so I'm going to invite you to move forward. But again, I'll continue to monitor the questions and we'll take pauses uh, when it's appropriate. Okay, that's great. I'm going to, I think what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to very, 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 very quickly go through uh, one more chapter, possibly two more. Um, and, and because this chapter, again, is going to help answer the question of, uh, I'm going to use this as a shorthand, but of representation not of who we wanted in the book but couldn't get in there, but who we wanted in the book and, and we were able to get them in there. Um, and, and the answer to that is it was a number of different groups uh, and groups that sometimes we view as being underrepresented in the Civil War literature. But before I get there, um, I wanna talk about, uh, again, some of the visual storytelling that we did. Each of the chapters, uh, you may recall that the first chapter on, uh, that, that I showed you when, when we were at the top of our discussion was called uh, Opera Glasses. Um, each of the chapters uh, is object-based. There is a single object that runs through the chapters. So this chapter that we just talked about a few moments ago, this one is called The Noose. And then uh, this one is called The Magic Bullet. Um, and it's a chapter about the importance of rifled muskets. It's an, a chapter about the way in which technological innovations and, uh, and the casting of minne balls uh, was so important during the Civil War. And what you can see here is the way in which Jonathan is able to capture for readers how a minne ball is able to bore through the air toward its target uh, and therefore is a far more accurate uh, weapon than a smooth bore, than a bullet fired out of a smooth bore musket. The minne ball's casting allowed it to hold together even as it came out of a rifled uh, uh, long gun barrel um, with this very, very tight spin. And, and as these bullets were able to, because they were able to move through the air with this tight spin, they were far more accurate, uh, which meant that tactics in the Civil War had to change. One of the things that we did want to talk about was battlefield tactics, but also we wanted to talk a little bit about medical history. And again, I apologize, the book is, is, is a little bit gross, you'll forgive me, but you can see here what happens to a human body when a bullet uh, goes into it. It, it. it almost explodes a man's arm, which then led us to a discussion not only of this wounded soldier and what he was going through, but also his effort to get medical care, which allowed us to talk about not only, okay, I'm gonna move beyond the, uh, the amputation scene, but it allowed us to talk about gender in the Civil War, which we do in several chapters. We wanted to talk about the role of women in the war, not only on the home front, which was significant, but also on the front lines and the way in which the Civil War was a spur for massive innovation in the history of American medicine, and particularly for women who moved into roles as nurses. Uh, and so this is a, uh, an image of a woman who's nursing uh, a soldier um, who's struggling with the realities of being on the front lines, trying to take care of a soldier who's had to have his arm amputated because battlefield amputations, as, as many, maybe most of you probably know, uh, were very, very common uh, during the Civil War, um, and then ultimately uh, whose patient dies. Um, and, and the way in which she's uh, trying to care uh, for this man. And then finally, we have a last image that shows uh, just how common this was, how brutal these practices were. Uh, because in many respects, uh, although I'm a Civil War historian, um, this is, uh, it, it is, it is an anti-war book. I, I don't want readers coming away from this book understanding that the Civil War was exclusively glorious, uh, that it was a moment uh, of, of uh, somehow shrouded in romance. I don't want them thinking about Moonlight and Magnolias. I want them aware that it was, that it was an extraordinarily brutal contest uh, that cost upwards of, of seven to 800,000 lives. And, and left hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other people permanently disabled. 
And again, I'll pause there, see if people have questions. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. The first is from uh, Jennifer, our TA tonight, and she's curious if these, if this graphic novel comes with an appendix. Um, there, there's such small details and such such nuance to what you've created that working with younger students that might be really helpful. Is there a teacher's guide or any kind of background knowledge that uh, you've provided? So we asked the uh, we asked the the press, the publishers, if they would allow us to do an online teacher's guide, and uh, they did not want us to. Um, and my sense of, I, you're gonna have to forgive me because I don't remember precisely, but I believe that their reasoning was that again, they didn't want this book to end up pigeonholed only in the education market. And they thought that if we created that kind of an online tool, uh, it was going to make it less likely that it would sell more broadly. Uh, I, I still, I'll be honest with you, I have deep regrets about that because I think it would have been really helpful for teachers. It does have a, a bibliographic note at the end and it also has an introduction that introduces people who are reading uh, the book, some of the nuances in the book. Um, and so uh, it, it, some of that gets covered in the text itself. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I think that's good for now. Why don't you move uh, to your next chapter and we'll we'll circle back to questions. Okay, so this is this is gonna be the last chapter that I'll I'll uh, run through. This is a chapter early in the book. As you can see, this is uh, page 13. So this is the second chapter in the book. It's called a writ. That's the document, sorry, that's the, the object in this chapter. And and what you're seeing here, this is this is our effort uh, Again, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to date myself, but I'm not sure how many of you um, saw the Pixar movie Up. Uh, it has this beautiful montage scene of, uh, of the lead character going from being a boy to an old man, and it happens in a very, very short span of time. And this was our effort to do the road to the Civil War uh, with this kind of a montage. So what you're seeing on this first thing is a number of the great documents uh, in uh, that are the foundational documents of the United States. But ultimately, what we're suggesting is the true foundation is a is a tension between slavery and liberty. And then we walk readers through a number of critical episodes on the road to the Civil War. You can see the Missouri Compromise here between free and slave states. Here we've got a surveyor. Uh, you can see here, this is William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator in 1831 when Garrison's press was thrown into the Ohio River. Uh, again, um, this is a, a moment in which we've got uh, non-fictional characters delivering non-fictional dialogue. We're very, very uh, clear about that. Uh, and then here we've got the United States-Mexican War. Uh, beyond that, we've got the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. Again, drawing a clear line here. We've got, a, a, uh, we've got the, again, unfortunately, perhaps uh, a little bit clo too close to home. Uh, this week, we've got the the caning of Charles Sumner by Preston Brooks uh, in the well of the United States Senate. Uh, we've got Bleeding Kansas and John Brown with his broadsword uh, here covered in the blood uh, of, of some of the, the pro-slavery men that he murdered, the Dred Scott decision, of course. And then Ex parte Merriman uh, in the beginning of the Civil War in which we try to begin to introduce readers to the way in which uh, civil liberties um, often are sacrificed during wartime. And so the remainder of the chapter is about this writ. And then finally, what we see is we see this edifice crumbling. Uh, these beliefs could not exist, the belief, of, the belief that slavery needed to be protected and that we were a nation of liberty, a nation that was founded in the idea of freedom. Uh, how to remove just one of them without toppling the whole edifice? That's the question we ask um, as we're moving readers into uh, the, the beginning of the book. And again, I'll, I'll leave it there, see if we have any, any questions, and uh, we can go from there. 
Fantastic. Uh, again, everyone, please do use the Ask Professor Kelman uh, tab if you'd like to ask a formal question. I've been monitoring the audience chat as well. If there's anything you'd like for me to bring forward, just, just pop it in there. Um, Ari, let me ask you this question. Um, what kind of response have you gotten to this book, to this publication, not, not from the education group? We've seen that reaction in the audience, and I suspect it's similar to what most educators would respond, but how have other historians uh, in, in your field, at your school, at your, in your department, how have other folks responded to your contributions here? Um, so let me give you a, a two-part answer to that. Uh, the first part is that um, I, was, uh, I was quite anxious, as you might imagine, that the scholarly community would, would wonder what the heck I was doing with my time when I published this. Uh, that they would perceive this as somehow frivolous or, um, or, or insufficiently scholarly uh, or insufficiently important. Um, and uh, I, I was very, very lucky that immediately before uh, this book was published, um, I, I won a ton of prizes for a scholarly book that I published at, at almost the same time. Um, and so it, it, it worked out in such a way that it became harder to criticize me as a dilettante or, or again, as someone who's, who's insufficiently serious about uh, the historian's craft because the profession had just weighed in and, and said that, oh, no, actually, he's, he's won all these prizes and he's a fancy pants. Um, the, the corollary to that is that then I, I was really lucky in that it actually was reviewed in a lot of scholarly journals. I was, I was surprised by that. Uh, and our reviews in scholarly journals were, were uniformly positive. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what to say about that. I think I probably could do a better job being critical of the book than most of the people who read it. But we we ended up being uh, we ended up doing pretty well um, in in terms of reviews. In other words, you have to be a badass in in order to uh, to, to be able, to be able to do this and then show the worth. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, it, it, there, <laughs> there there's so much of my career that's just been sort of good fortune and happenstance that I uh, I've, I've sort of stopped trying to keep track. Mm. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, have you? approached or have you considered new topics for the same uh, collaboration whether it's with Jonathan or another artist yeah Jonathan and I are are noodling around on a, a book about the um, about the 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 Cheyenne uh, Native American nation in in the years between an event that I've written about the Sand Creek massacre uh, and the and the beginning of the of the reservation era for the Northern Cheyennes. It's a it's a very very it's a kind of sprawling epic story. The tribe gets uh, fractured um, by this massacre uh, in southeastern Colorado, splits into two branches: a, a northern and a and a southern uh, Cheyenne branch. The northern Cheyenne uh, branch um, is uh, was. Was, was imprisoned in a federal prison camp. Uh, there's a huge uh, a prison break. And eventually the Northern Cheyennes fight their way into uh, uh, Southern Montana. They, they get back to the land that they consider their ancestral homeland. And they keep fighting over a period of two decades until eventually the federal government finally says, oh my goodness, enough, just take it. If that's the land you want, you can have it. That's your reservation. Um, and so, uh, and and so, Jonathan and I have talked about doing that, but unfortunately, um, for unfortunately for about twelve different reasons, uh, I've I've been an administrator now um, for about four years, uh, and I keep on uh, getting uh, promoted into new roles, um, and so I haven't had as much time to work on on this stuff as I'd like to. Uh, he and I have promised each other that. We're going to get back to this, but it's probably not going to be for a couple of other years. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, let's circle back then to uh, some of the content in the graphic novel Battle Lines. And again, I'd like to reframe and rephrase a question a little bit. Uh, this is from Holly, who's in Los Angeles Unified. 
Uh, first of all, she very much appreciated your willingness to give all of our audience a heads up regarding the slide of lynching, doing it multiple times, really framing it in a way that gave folks the choice to engage with it uh, directly or not. Um, but talk to us a little bit, Ari, from your perspective, again, as a historian and a university educator, um, talk to us about the ways that you approach difficult topics like uh, the, the horrific legacy of lynching or the violence or imagery from source work that might be disturbing. How, how, do, you, how do you frame that in your own teaching? Well, so I teach uh, I, I teach the Civil War uh, fairly frequently, and um, in recent years, uh, because of pressures on uh, public universities to try and keep enrollments high, um, I've team taught with uh, one of my dear friends, a really wonderful scholar named Eric Rauschway, a course on World War II, um, and both the Civil War uh, course and the World War II course have uh, an, an enormous number of opportunities um, to be discussing uh, particularly horrific events uh, and or images. So, so in the Civil War, um, obviously there are episodes of racial violence. Um, there has to be an extensive uh, discussion um, of, of the practice and the implications uh, of the enslavement of people of African descent, uh, of the struggle over white supremacy, um, and, and then in the war itself of the brutality uh, and, and, uh, and the violence associated with the battles. And, and I do uh, very much what I did today, um, though I'm going to, uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to talk about the two courses uh, in very different ways and explain why I make different choices. In the Civil War class, I don't use, uh, and this is going to sound ridiculous having, having given this presentation, but I don't use uh, visuals. Um, I, I use a traditional lecture style and I then lead discussion. It usually has about 120 to 140 people in it. And I lead discussion about particularly critical issues. So I'll do an informal lecture for about 10 minutes and then I'll ask a series of questions and run a discussion with the 120 people. I don't use images for a very, very specific reason. In that course, I'm trying to teach students how to take notes on a lecture. And I, and I talk to them about this in the syllabus. But even so, when I am getting into a detailed discussion of, let's say, the Colfax Massacre or the Fort Pillow Massacre or others, episodes in which people of African descent were killed, uh, I will give people a warning that the content is about to become very, very challenging. Now, in the World War II class, um, that's a class where Professor Rauschway and I have gone in an entirely different direction. And one of the skills that we're trying to teach students is how to make sense of mass media depictions of the past. And so we are using a lot of newsreel footage. We're using a lot of documentary footage. We're using some of Walt Disney's uh, incredibly racist cartoons um, depicting uh, uh, people of Japanese descent, American citizens of Japanese descent. We're using Nazi propaganda about Jewish people and about homosexuals and gypsies and others. Um, and and we, we generally have to, in that course, at the top of each lecture, warn the students about what might be to come because we really aren't in a position to every three to five minutes say, let me take a minute here, let's stop. Having said that, when we show them particularly challenging materials, we do what you did today, Andy, which is, it's really interesting. We actually do stop class and we ask people please to just sit with the material and we ask them not to ask questions in that moment and just to take a moment to take in what they're seeing uh, as a way both to honor the image and also to ask them to process this in a very, very uh, deliberate way. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, here's a question for me, Ari. Um, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a native Virginian. 
have always lived in the South or the Southeast or the Mid-Atlantic. Um, teaching the Civil War has its own challenges and importance in this part of the country. Uh, a lot of our audience tonight comes from California. What's important in your view as an historian uh, to, to acknowledge that sort of regional understanding of an event like this? Is it different for you uh, in your view that uh, to approach these topics uh, on the West Coast versus the East versus the South or or is it all kind of the same? And maybe as a, as a secondary follow up question, is something like battle lines the way to do that? Um, sorry, uh, Natalie just asked me to go back to this slide, and I and I did. Uh, and then Andy, to your question. Um, uh, so I began my career at the University of Oklahoma, um, which, despite the fact that it is uh, situated at the crossroads of the South and the West, um, is is very very much uh, identified uh, with the South. Um, and has a deep identification with the Civil War, despite the fact that it was so-called Indian territory uh, during uh, the era of the Civil War. Um, and teaching the war there was one experience. Moving out to California was an entirely different experience. And one of the things that I've had to do as I've moved into California is I've had to talk about the way in which the Civil War wasn't exclusively a war that was fought over the question of the expansion or the future of slavery, but it was also a war that was fought over an American empire. Who was going to have control of the American West, whether it was going to be the, the South or the Confederacy or the Union or the North, these are different things, I say that advisedly, and I do that to try and welcome students in California. I teach at a, a satellite campus in, in the state university system. UC Davis is a, is a phenomenal, internationally renowned university, but, but nevertheless, we're not Berkeley, we're not LA. Most of my students are, are from the Central Valley or the Bay Area, and it's just important for them to have an understanding of the way in which the war had not only implications for the West, but also roots in the West. Now, none of that is to take away from what I hear you saying, which is that both the teaching and the learning of Civil War history have a different moral valence in different regions of the country. And again, that's one of the things that I try and convey for students when I get to the end of the course and we're talking about Reconstruction and I do a unit on the memory of the war. Right. and the way in which war has been memorialized differently in different places. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, uh, I suspect, very different in terms of curricular expectations, depending on where you are. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring forward a question from Miguel, who's joining us from LA Unified as well. Uh, it's a little bit sideways, but I think it'd be interesting for all of us to understand this from your perspective as an historian. Are you aware, Ari, of, of whether or not photos of wars and battle and, and death in other eras and other wars were also staged from the actual events? Oh, uh, great question, and the answer is yes. There it is. This is, and in fact, it, it, it predates photographs. Uh, for, you, you can see uh, depictions of battles in, in oil paintings, uh, that are very, very intended to, excuse me, very, very much intended to convey a particular narrative or a particular vision of how the artist wants that event understood or remembered. But this is even true of statuary, right, of, of carved stone and the way in which uh, battles uh, and, and episodes of violence either are or are not, in many instances, memorialized. So again, what, what the, what, one of the things that I was working on while I was writing this book was this history of, of, the, of the fight over how either to remember or forget the Sand Creek ma uh, massacre. Um, and, and so one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is not only uh, the narration of uh, these episodes of violence, but also the silences surrounding them. But again, the answer is that yes, there are very, very, there's, there's an intentionality 
of the way in which these things are depicted visually for audiences. Absolutely. And for that reason, can be treated as both primary and secondary sources in a way. A hundred percent. And again, that's that's part of what we were getting at with uh, with with the image of the of the Gardner uh, photograph, where mm-hmm. you're you're seeing something that we're using as a primary source that we're embedding in a secondary source. It is both fictional and non-fictional. Uh, it is an image or an artifact whose meaning shifts depending on the perspective from which you're viewing it. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, again, I'm going to encourage, we have just a few more minutes left in tonight's session. Uh, if you have questions for Professor Kelman, please do drop them in the Ask Professor Kelman tab. Um, uh, all right, so talk, to us, talk to us about where where we can purchase this. Uh, Amanda is curious about where she can buy this, and she'd really rather not give her money to Jeff Bezos. Uh, I think, Amanda, that you should be able to, if you've got a local bookstore or if you use Abe Books or any of those, you should be able to to order it through them. It's 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 pretty it's pretty widely available. Um, the other thing you could do is you could go on the Macmillan website. Uh, the, the publisher is Macmillan, um, and, and they're, they're for Strauss and Giroux, and uh, excuse me, and they're Hill and Wang, and see and look there. But I, yeah. I don't think it's going to be challenging to find this. Yeah, great. Thank you. You don't need to use, uh, need to use Amazon. Here's a question for you, uh, Professor. Um, you know, it's a, there, there's a lot of work that went into this, a lot of time, a lot of collaboration. But certainly there must be a panel or a page or you know, that one sort of um, greatest hit, I mean, the song that you are the most proud of because you were able to connect all these dots to display your message with the visual, with the sequence, et cetera. Do you have a favorite page? Is there one page that really you're like, we got it right there? Uh, You're looking at it right now. Um, Let me show you my least favorite page though, uh, because I actually put it in the, I did, it's here. Um, so this is the uh, th- this is our chapter that's um, about uh, the the story that's depicted in the film Glory of the of the 51st Massachusetts Regiment, which was a a, a black or African American regiment, um, and and we were trying to at the end of this chapter give a sense of the way in which these uh, these men were were horribly mistreated. Uh, in uh, South Carolina and uh, along the coast. Um, and, and I just, I was never happy with it. I, I remain unhappy with it to this day. Uh, I'll be very candid with you. Were Jonathan here, he would tell you this. Um, uh, illustrators and cartoonists often describe the challenge of trying to draw the faces of African-American men because the work that they're doing ends up unintentionally looking like parody and it and and it almost looks like a racist caricature. Uh, Jonathan and I went back and forth um, maybe 50 or 75 times when he would send me images and I would say, you know, I can't even look at this. Uh, it just, I know it's not what you're intending to do. Um, and so here was a place where we tried to compromise. We tried to show this. And it just didn't work. It just wasn't. It wasn't successful. So anyway, I I, I always like ending a, a talk on failure. Maybe someone else can ask one more question and bail me out, so I don't have to do that. You know, I do. I have one more question for you, um, and I I mean this in the way that that you interpret it. Um, uh, Ari, uh, again, be as vulnerable as you would like. Are are you optimistic? Uh, about the United States right now? About, about, the world about everything world. right now. You're an authority voice who understands the past, which helps with the present. Are you optimistic? Um, <laughs> uh, short answer is yes. Um, long answer, I, if I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid uh, a discussion of partisan politics right now because I, yeah. I don't think that anyone in this audience has any interest uh, in, in who I vote for or, or who I think people should be voting for. Um, so let me let me talk instead about the, the way in which uh, I understand or have tried to understand uh, the events 
of the past, uh, let's say, 10 days or, or perhaps even four years. Um, it is easy, or it has been easy over the last 10 days uh, since the, the, the immediate, uh, since the period immediately prior to the runoff elections in Georgia, when there were revelations about President Trump reaching out to, uh, to elected officials in Georgia, asking them to consider overturning uh, the vote in the state. Um, it, it, it was easy beginning in that moment to feel a sense of despair. And it became easier, uh, I think, for me and for people who are close to me um, to fall into that despair uh, after the, the recent, and I don't care, the, the nomenclature, uh, the taxonomies don't mean very much to me. Call it an insurrection call it a coup, it, 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 I, for, from my perspective, those definitional debates are, uh, are, are beside the point. But whatever, whatever the violence was that took place on the Capitol, what we saw was uh, a group of people, either coordinated or, or, or not, who were trying to impede the peaceful transfer of power in the executive branch. We, we, we know that. How involved the executive branch was or was not in that event, we don't know yet. We won't know for some time. Regardless, it was easy in that moment to slip deeper into that state of despair. And yet, I, 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 am, I am, as it happens, uh, a, a relatively optimistic person, but also quite cynical. I, I keep these things uh, close to my heart at the same time. Here's what I have to say. They didn't succeed. We're going to have a peaceful transfer of power in this country. And at the same time, we are beginning to see uh, including across party lines. Again, I'm not speaking about the, the which party is or isn't better. That's, that's for other people to decide for themselves. But we are seeing across party lines for the first time in a very long time, we are seeing elected officials of both parties come together to condemn extra constitutional behavior and to voice their unalloyed support for the various processes, the systems, I mean, you're, you're seeing some of them on this page uh, that, that are the foundation of this republic. And so you asked me if I'm optimistic, and I'm going to say to you that I am optimistic. Uh, I'm also very, very sad. Uh, 330 some thousand people are dead. They are never coming back. Uh, some of them are my close friends. They are gone forever. Um, I haven't seen my mom now uh, in over a year. My mom is elderly and in failing health. Um, my, my older son wasn't able to begin college this year, despite the fact that he earned the right to do so. My younger son, who's in eighth grade, has, has been trapped in his home uh, for, for the better part of nine months now with, with his parents. And I got to tell you, like, like most eighth graders, he doesn't enjoy that very much. And yet, I am hopeful that there are better days ahead. That's all I can say. All right. Thank you so much for leading tonight's session. Uh, we appreciate your, your perspective and your insights and your willingness to work as friends and colleagues with our audience. Uh, thank you, Professor. Totally my pleasure. Um, I'm available to any of you who may want to reach out to me. Uh, you can find me on uh, uh, on email. I, I, I know I'm supposed to tell you that uh, you can also find me on Twitter, but I'm very rarely there. Um, so just send me an email if you need anything. And, and again, uh, thanks to the National Humanities Center, uh, not only for organizing this evening's event, which I enjoyed, but also for being one of the, the great champions for, for humanistic discourse in this country, uh, and, and particularly uh, for uh, scholarly endeavors.